There's a lovely scene in, in, in the fifth episode of that series where, where Maureen actually does die of cancer, and it's yeah. really touching. Sad, yeah. and, uh, and, and, uh, and after she dies, David drags her off the bed, and they do oops upside your head um, <laughs> with, with this sort of dead body. And, um, but, but not at all with a wink, you know, or, you know not played for laughs at all. And I just, I just think it, it just feels really rich territory to, to be sort of have the laughter completely constrict in your throat because it's so... I mean, some of the most delicious times were in Edinburgh and, and the live shows where you would properly feel that, that, what he's talking about, that kind of terrible, you know, when I was doing Jeff's Best Man speech, which became appalling to hear, and the audience were si deadly silent and it was just uncomfortable, <coughs> you know, yeah. kind of quiet in the Canal Cafe, people wanting to leave, and then allowing, and just screwing that knife in, and then allowing it, the release of the, of the laughter with the... But it's Mike and Cheryl's day, you know, that, and it was always great to be able to just release it and also, allow them to laugh again. The hair lip sketch where, um, where I was playing hair lip and Reese was the, the schoolboy, and we had a real pot of coffee which we made every day, and when, when I unscrewed the thing, you could see the steam. I mean, it was a tiny theatre in, in the Boiling presence. hot coffee. Boiling, boiling hot coffee, and I did a switch, so there was one cold no, one I used and one to be hot terrified one. every night, like, oh, please. Because <laughs> had and boiling the audience, hot could smell the coffee and yeah. see the steam, and then I threw it in his face like this. And the shock in that moment yeah, from the great. audience is... What we're talking about here is, is drama and, and theatre. Yes, yeah, totally. Uh, and, you know, these, these were little moments of, of coup de theatre that were built into the original League stage shows and then have been expanded upon. Because, yeah. So it's one of the things that marks out what you do. And uh, it'd be interesting just to touch a moment on some of your influences, because I remember when we first got together, that although there, were, there was comedy in there, as, as some of the stuff that we bonded over, equally there was a, there was a lot of drama. Like David Mamet was, was someone that you, uh, uh, mm. that you both loved. Uh, well, who, who else would you... Ken know? Loach. We, we, we loved the films of, of Ken Loach, especially sort of Riff Raff and... Um, Raining Stones. Raining Stones yeah. and, and, and Mike Lee. And, and I think, you know... The, Nuts it, in May, of course. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, and, and, you know, there's... Um, Peter Greenaway, you know, they felt like a very rich time um, coming, coming through that sort of 80s and, and 90s of, uh, of, of very fun things that we found hysterically funny but weren't necessarily comedies. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. we, we do play, we like to have gags, we like to have very structured gags within the other stuff that we do. And it was just pulling together all these different influences. Like Were there said. other people out there at the same time who you think were drawing on similar influences when, when we were starting out? Do you think, uh, like, that's Steve a good Coogan question. and Julia? Yeah. Julia Davis, Julia definitely, probably when Nighty Night came. A like-minded, uh, yeah, we thought that's, that's the world we're in as well. Yeah. well. When we came to Edinburgh, there was a lot of sketch shows that were fairly shambolic, and we remember watching one, and they came on and said, we haven't got an ending for this yet, but it doesn't matter, you, you'll laugh anyway. And we just thought that was really, people have paid quite a lot of money to see a show. So we, we did rehearse very hard, and we spent a long time in, and putting the show together, and I think that's... I mean, that, it's not rocket science, that, is it? It's, it should be like that. I know that It should be, but the, the sketch comedy can be seen as, as, a, as a sort of... Loose. Yeah, loose, Unplugged. and a lesser cousin, and, and you can get a... It doesn't really matter, because it's sketchy, and one's crap, and then the next one will be on. But we, you know, we really wanted to put a, a bit more craft in, into it than that. Um, and I think, at the time, it, that's why I think probably we got the recognition we got, because it was different. And I think now, if you go, I mean, you know, we're here surrounded by probably a lot of great ske sketch comics, and I think a lot of them, you know, I think we, we were probably the beginning of, of, of a lot of that movement. So just touching on that, that formal discipline again, it really came to our head in the first series of uh, Psychoville um, with the, uh, the, the, the rope episode, episode four of the yes. first series, which has come known as the rope episode, because... It, it nods to Hitchcock's uh, rope in that it's all one shot and all in, in one room. Yeah, it's actually want, two shots, but two, yes. Do you want to talk about where, how that came about? And well, that, yeah, it was all um, by accident that that episode existed. We'd had a general uh, structure to the series where, kind of, in our minds anyway, on the board when we looked at the story threads, Every character had an episode, and it was kind of there. They were the backbone, and then other characters obviously would appear. But it was their episode. You might not really have felt like that watching it, but we felt that's Robert's episode, that's Dawn's. And Maureen David didn't have one, and it wasn't 
I don't know why that was, but we just didn't, did it? And then it was like, John Plowman came to us and said, could you do, um, an, uh, could we, we can get more money for a seventh episode, but could it be cheap? Could it be, say, uh, you know, like the EastEnders, the bottleneck episode where it's just Dot in a laundrette? And could it just be you and Steve in a room? And I think that's what happened. And then we got to thinking about uh, Maureen and David, the fact we hadn't, didn't have a story for them, and we thought, could we do a rope? In which, and we thought of rope because of Hitchcock take, doing these 15-minute takes or 10-minute takes, and then moving into someone's back and pulling out again. That would be the cut point. And we thought, could we do a half hour of telly? At one point, it was going to be live. Remember that? It was going to be a live mm. episode. And we wanted to do the whole thing in one take. And we were thwarted by technology, because the arm of the dolly had to be powered up again after 20 minutes. <laughs> so 22 minutes in, we had to do a, a cut, and which happened on the back of the trunk, just like in rope, where the body is hidden. And then the last 11 minutes were, was to the end. And Very theatrical, because it all had yeah. to happen in camera. There was a bit where I hang a body on the back of a door, and it was weighted, and then the door opens, and a knife goes in the body, and that was all kind of switched with little um, trap doors and magnets, and it was, it was great. It was such an achievement, not just for us as actors remembering it, but um, just everybody, because the whole thing was a ballet with everyone moving the furniture out as the camera moved in and moved back out. How long did you have to rehearse it? And we had a, two days, did we? A day and a half. A day and a half, because we only had Mark for a, a, half day, a day, half a day. And we, we thought it'd be great Mark if Gatiss. Mark, Mark Gatiss Gatiss would be the third character in the story. We thought it'd be great. In the end, it was, I'm really glad it was Mark, because we were talking, not initially of it being Mark, but then we thought, we've got no time to rehearse this very complicated thing. It'd be so good if we could get him, who we knew yeah. could just fall You in. need a shorthand, don't you? Yeah. I think when John first suggested it, our first reaction was, no, why would you want to do, you know, you've got this multi-stranded thing, yeah. why would you do want to... But then if you make those um, restrictions work for you and see them as a positive, we thought it could be really um, something special. Yeah, it wasn't like what's what can um, ultimately be perceived as being a, 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 a trick or a, a gimmick. It did, was born out of those two characters, which actually felt quite good. Uh, and full of really hysterically funny lines as well. You didn't sacrifice the comedy to... Yeah, the... hopefully not. I mean, well, it is very self-contained. It's like a little play, that, yeah. that episode, yeah. Um, so let's, because I'm aware of time, let's, let's take the leap from that episode into Inside Number Nine. <laughs> when, when you were conceiving of Inside Number Nine, were you drawing on your experience having made that episode at all? Was, was that yeah, I think so. I yeah. think we, we really enjoyed doing that. We enjoyed the discipline of that. And, and I think, um, you know, there's something about not leaving a room and there's something that felt really exciting about it in this day of fast cuts and things, you know, the TV has sped up so much about going back to those, those play for todays and, and those thing of one room or one set. Um, and, and again, going back to the theatricality, that was a big thing. We'd both just come off the back of, I was at the National and you were in the West End. And we thought it'd be great to do something like those, you know, those filmed plays, uh, which we don't seem to get anymore. No, and don't. then we drew on the sort of Tales of the Unexpected element as well, which where each one had a, a little bit of a, twist of the tale, or it doesn't have to be as prescriptive as that. Um, and we thought that could be quite exciting territory and something, we've always wanted to do something that's not in vogue at the time. So Psychoville, this sort of comedy thriller, now you've got stuff like The Wrong Mans and um, that prison one, Bad... Orange is the new... Um, oh no, the... Which you worked on it. Um, oh, you mean Dead Boss, Sharon? <laughs> Dead Boss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a lot more of that, but at the time there wasn't that much. Mm -hmm. And similarly, it felt like a good reaction to this very fast-paced TV, just to slow down a bit mm -hmm. and, and set things. And we, so that was the thing. Each one's going to be its own story, and we're going to limit the action to one set or one place. And it's a hard sell. I don't, it wasn't uh, instantly, oh, that's great, let's do that. It was, um, there were a while, BBC, a while thinking... How many scripts it. did you have to write for them? We did three. You did three yeah, before the script did, was We green did two there. and then another one, yeah, and then yeah. It, and finally they said, oh, go on then. But it was, I think the thought was the, uh, you know, you're not gaining an audience. Each week you're starting again, and that's very unappealing. Um, but, you know, the, the counter-argument when, when we did Psychoville was that, well, what if you want to join it in episode four? You, you won't be able to follow it. So it was like that was the absolute opposite of what you're telling us now, which was <laughs> you, we can join it in episode four because it's standalone. But... Um, I think ultimately we didn't care about any of that. We just thought if, it's, if the stories are good, then you watch it. And I think audiences are, are that. And I think that if the, and there is a thing across it, which is 
our sensibility, and then you, that's what you what you're getting. But there were good, just good stories, I yeah. hope, and, and I think they hooked you in, and um, that's what was uh, fun about them.